Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about random sampling distributions. This is the most important concept to understand in order to calculate p-value, so I am going to get a little repetitive today. Inferential statistics are all about p-values. Inferential statistics are the hardest to calculate and the most important statistics. They allow us to make conclusions about our hypotheses. No other statistics allow us to truly make conclusions about our hypotheses. So what is a p-value? You've probably heard other things, but a p-value is the probability of sampling and effect, and for today's case, it's mean differences, has extreme or more extreme, has the effect we sampled if the null hypothesis were true. Now, that's the definition of p-value I want you to learn and memorize. So spend some time with that one. But all it is, it is, it's the probability of sampling an effect. Today's examples are all mean differences. Has extreme or more extreme has the effect, mean differences for today, that we sampled if the null hypothesis were true. If you learned a different rule, you are just patently wrong. It's not the chance, it's not the probability that chance is driving your observed results. That is wrong and incorrect. If you don't believe me, the entire PowerPoint proves my point. Let's move on. Probability review is just, probability is pretty simple. The chance of an event occurring. So probability of rolling a three on a dice, you can roll one three, right, out of six possible outcomes. A one, two, three, four, five, and six. So one out of six. What's the probability flipping heads on a coin flip? It's one out of two. When we say probability, we know that we can solve those problems, we can solve those divisions, and we can get probability values like the second one, because it's easier math, that probability is 0.5. One divided by six, we do the math. I'm not gonna do that today, but you know, it's like, yeah, we're just not gonna do it today, okay? But probability is very simple. But I wanna point out that probabilities are essentially picture problems. Now, this is the probability of rolling a one on a die or rolling not a one on a die. So we have six potential, six potential, um, Outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, and six on a die roll. The probability of rolling a one is one-sixth of the entire whole. So probabilities are saying, hey, there's a whole possibility of options. This adds to 100% or a probability of one. What's the probability of finding one specific event? In this case, a dice roll. It's one-sixth, one divided by six. That's the probability of rolling one dice roll, but what's important here is not solving that problem, but actually realizing, hey, all probability calculations are picture problems, can be converted to a picture problem. Now, in psychology, we don't use circles and pie graphs. The shapes we use are these bell curves. The first, the first shape is the normal distribution, the second shape is the T distribution. I'm just gonna call them symmetrical bell curves. There are different times when we apply these different distributions, but you don't need to know that today. And today I'm just going to focus on this normal distribution. That's going to be the shape that we use in psychology to calculate our probabilities. So in the problem on the left, Donatello walks, in, walks, walks into a pizza restaurant. He cuts his pizza into six slices and he eats one. What proportion of the pizza did he eat? What or what percentage of the pizza did he eat? One out of six. That problem is functionally equivalent to the problem on your right. Given this bell curve, right? Donatello walks into a pizza restaurant. He orders a bell-shaped pizza. He eats a slice that's this size and a slice that's this size. What probability of the pizza did he eat? What percentage of the pizza did he eat? Probability times 100 is percentage. Percentage divided by 100 is probability. So these two problems, the one on the left that seems super simple and the one on the right that seems super complicated, find your p-value, are the same thinking, are the same thought process, are the same world. It's, and it's problems you did when you were in third grade. You did that Donatello problem. Maybe they didn't use Donatello, but if you had a fun teacher like I did, they definitely used Donatello, okay? So, you need to realize that when you're calculating p-values, instead of a circle, we're using a bell-shaped. 
and then we we're, our area is determined through a different set of processes, but we are still trying to figure out the area of the blue pie from the orange circle or the area of these gray slices from the entire bell. That is it. These, these problems are nothing new to you. Now, before we can get to how do we calculate p-value, we have to start with the null hypothesis. All p-values are founded in the null hypothesis. So without the null hypothesis, you cannot calculate p-value. So I noticed a lot of folks had gender in their studies. There was a gender question I was interested in, in a few years ago, and that question was simple. Are women more empathetic than men? Right? So that's what I'm interested in. That's my alternative hypothesis. But the null hypothesis is always the hypothesis of no difference. So for this example, my null hypothesis is that men and women have the same levels of empathy. The empathy of all men in the population, in this case, all men on this planet and all women on this planet are equal to each other. So the empathy of all men on our planet is equal to the empathy of all women on our planet. That's what I'd like to know. When I'm a psychologist, I am often thinking about it, the entire population of all the world's people. But that, that's all I'm saying here. I'm saying that my null hypothesis is that the empathy of all men on this planet is equal to the empathy of all women on this planet. This is my null hypothesis. This is the thing that I'm trying to disprove. You have heard that science is about falsifiability, I hope, in the previous class. Well, this is falsifiability turned into a practical application. We are trying to falsify this null hypothesis. We, we believe that women have more empathy than men. And we want, at least I did, and we want to try to falsify the null hypothesis that men and women have the same amount of empathy. So the first step, state your null hypothesis in words that make sense. That's what I did there. Now I'm going to show you some simple algebra. I treated my first equation like a real equation. I subtracted empathy of women from the right side. So I said I took minus empathy of women from both sides, and what I ended up with is that the empathy of men minus the empathy of women equals zero. I took out the stuff about the population because you now know that, right? Well, another way to say this is that my mean difference for empathy of men minus empathy of women is zero. Another way I can say this, because now that we know this, you can just say the mean difference. Once I know your, your independent variable and your dependent variable, I know that your hypothesis is that the mean difference equals zero. The null hypothesis has its own symbol, H0, semicolon, the mean difference equals zero. Or we can state it in the way that you'll see it presented in many textbooks, in many classes, and that is that your null hypothesis, H0, is equal to mu, the population mean of men's empathy, minus mu, the population mean of women's empathy. Mu means population means. So mu is essentially, mu translates into population mean. So this is how you state a null hypothesis. And I would like you to practice. Problem number one for your homework for today is choose one of your two level I, IVs and state your null hypothesis in the same six ways I did on the previous slide. Note, if you do not have one two level independent variable, eliminate levels of your independent variable until you have two levels work on that. Now we know what the null hypothesis is and now we have to convert it into a graphical problem to solve, right? So actually this, the first step of calculating the graphical problem is creating our bell. We have to create our bell. So drawing and creating the random sampling distribution of mean differences could be replaced with drawing and creating the random sampling distribution or, or drawing and creating the bell that we need that we need to calculate our p-value. So before I can go there, I just want to talk quickly about distributions. These are scores. A distribution of scores is simply all possible scoring options are presented on the x-axis. The frequency or number of times 
number of times something was observed is on your Y or, or vertical axis. So on your horizontal axis, you have all possible scores. On your vertical axis, you have N or frequency or times it was observed. So in this example, our data set are scores of 10, 12, 15, 15, 14, 19, 8, and 10. And here is our frequency distribution. This is a frequency distribution of scores. This is a real frequency distribution. It's not theoretical. So I just want you to know this is a distribution of scores. It's a graph of scores. On the x-axis, you have all possible scores. On the y-axis, you have the frequency with which they were observed. Now, I want you to realize that you can have distributions not just of scores, but you can have them of means, mean differences, um, standard deviations, variance, everything like that. You can have all these different types of distributions of, of, of things. You can have a distribution of means and mean differences and all that. Here, I just said these are means, and we have the same picture and the same slide. I just want you to know you can have distributions of means. Not all distributions are distributions of scores. Some students struggle with this. You can have a distribution of means. You can have a distribution of mean differences. Today, for all of our examples, we are talking about distributions of mean differences. So I want you to know that we can have all different types of distributions, and these are just what distributions are. So the review is over, and I want to talk about one specific sample one, one specific distribution it's called a sampling distribution of mean differences what is this sampling distribution of mean differences while this is not on the slide it is the most important distribution in all of inferential statistics it is so important it is the foundation of everything we're doing when we're calculating our p-value it is the most important thing in the world when calculating our p-value okay so it's important what else is it it's a probability ruler it's a ruler. It tells us the probability of sampling any mean difference if the null hypothesis were true and the actual population mean difference were zero. See what's going on there. It's a ruler. So it tells you the probability of sampling any mean difference from negative infinity to positive infinity if the null hypothesis were true and the actual population mean difference were equal to zero. This is a hypothetical distribution. It's created from theory, not data. See, it's a hypothetical distribution for if the null hypothesis were true. Right? It's a hypothetical distribution that assumes the null hypothesis is true. It's a distribution based on that assumption. It has a range from negative infinity to positive infinity. It, the most common mean difference is zero because of because if the null were true and there were no mean difference, the most common mean you would observe, the most common mean difference you would observe in a distribution of mean differences is zero. The shape is symmetrical. You just have to know it's symmetrical, normal or T, it doesn't matter. Normal's fine to think about for today. We're just thinking about this conceptually. And the standard deviation of the random sampling distribution of mean differences is called standard error. So let me go over this. That was me setting it up. What are the things? Well, number one, you know, it's, it's a sampling distribution of potential mean differences that range from negative infinity to positive infinity. Math theory gives it a shape. That shape is symmetrical. Normal, we'll say normal, symmetrical normal, right? If the null, it's a sampling distribution of all possible mean differences if the null hypothesis were true. So the most common mean difference in this random sampling distribution of mean differences is zero. So this is a distribution of mean differences. This zero is saying, What's the probability of sampling a mean difference of zero? We, have the, we can find the probability of sampling a mean difference of one, of two, of three, of four, of five, of 10,000, of a billion, of infinity, right? Same thing, negative one, negative two. What's the probability of sampling a mean difference of negative three? What's the probability of sampling a mean difference, not a mean of negative four? A mean difference of negative five, not a mean, right? A mean difference of negative a billion, a mean difference all, all the way, a negative Google, Right? All of that. So what this is, is it's a ruler. It tells me the probability of sampling any mean difference if the null hypothesis were true. That's what it tells me. Right? This is my ruler for calculating probabilities. And guess what? P-value just means probability. And so 
I want to say one more thing. What's the probability of sampling a mean difference of one? That is infinitesimally small. Mean difference of one is here. The probability of sampling a mean difference of one is the area under the, under the curve that's in this line. Well, due to some math theory, the area of a line is infinitesimally small. So technically, the probability of sampling any mean difference is zero. Okay? But that's not what our p-value is. Our p-value is the probability of sampling, if sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme as the mean difference we sampled. Okay, and we'll hit on that a little bit later, but I'm pointing out, this is the shape, this is the circle, this is how you make the bell. This is how you make the bell so we can calculate P. Let's do it again. Um, I noticed in someone's study they had a pretty cool, cool experiment, smells versus no smells on memory, right? What is the random sampling distribution of mean differences on smell versus no smell on memory and we got to realize that it's assuming the null hypothesis is true, assuming that there is no difference between smell and no smell on memory. Uh, what is the random sampling distribution of mean differences assuming this null hypothesis is true? I didn't state it in the title, but it's always, these distributions are always if the null hypothesis were true. Well, it's theoretical, so it ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity. The shape is this symmetrical normal normal-ish distribution for today the mean is zero the mean of this distribution is zero that is that means if the null hypothesis were true this is a distribution of mean differences the most commonly sampled mean difference is zero the mean of this distribution is zero because the most commonly sampled mean difference is zero and also, the standard deviation of this distribution is called standard error. I just want you to know that. The standard deviation in this distribution, which we talked about last time, our best approximation of the average deviation in this distribution is called standard error. It looks identical to our previous shape. Let's do it again. I saw another cool one in our studies, our introversion versus, ex versus extroversion on memory. So. What is the random sampling distribution of inversion versus extroversion on memory assuming the null hypothesis were true? Well, this is a theoretical distribution that ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity. The shape of this distribution is symmetrical, and today I chose normal to illustrate this idea. The most commonly observed, the most commonly observed or sampled mean difference in this distribution is a sampled mean difference of zero. And once again, the standard deviation in this distribution is called standard error. Now, what is this? Every line on this distribution does not represent an individual score. It represents a sampled mean difference, a sampled mean difference in an experiment. In this case, it's introverts versus extroverts, their memory score. So introvert memory minus extrovert memory. That's one sampled mean difference that would be in this specific distribution. You know, any potential sampled mean difference from this experiment, introversion memory minus extroversion memory, is on this ruler. This is the shape. This is the circle. This is our ruler. This is the thing we need to be able to calculate our p-values, right? And it's all set up. The only reason we can do this is because we assume the null hypothesis is true. If the null hypothesis were true, what's the probability of sampling a mean difference difference of zero, right? It's quite high, right? We can see that. It's quite high. We know the exact probability of sampling a mean difference of zero is infinitesimally small, right? But zero or more extreme than zero is a little bit higher. We'll talk about p-value in a second, but I'm foreshadowing a little bit, but I want you to realize we is, what is the probability of random sampling any mean from negative infinity to positive infinity any mean difference, excuse me, I'll restate it. What is the probability of sampling any mean difference from negative infinity to positive infinity if the null hypothesis were true and the actual population mean difference were zero? We can figure that out with this shape. I think I have one more. Yes, we do. Now, this one's fun. What is the random sampling distribution of random sampling distribution of mean differences comparing students' scores of organization for me and Dr. Winterrode, assuming the null hypothesis were true. Well, the null hypothesis 
is not what you're expecting. The null hypothesis is not the alternative to the hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that I am less organized than Dr. Winrod. I will eat that all day, but the null hypothesis... But the null hypothesis... I don't know why that happened. But the null hypothesis is that the mean difference on Dr. Winrod's scores of organization from her students and the organization scores from my students is equal to zero, right? So what is the random sampling distribution of this specific case? If the null hypothesis were true, well, it ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity. It has a shape that is symmetrical, normal. The most commonly sampled mean difference, not mean, not score, the most commonly sampled mean difference, Derwicki minus Winter Road, right? In, if we ran this experiment across multiple semesters, right, the most commonly sampled mean difference, if the null hypothesis were true, is zero. The standard deviation of this distribution is called standard error. This is not a distribution of scores. It is not a distribution of means. It is a distribution of mean differences that represent Derricky's organization scores minus Winterode's organization scores. That is it. This is the circle that we need to calculate the pizza slices. Problem number two, build on your problem number one. Create a random sampling distribution of mean differences that assumes the null hypothesis you described in problem number one is true. I want the shape. I want the upper and lower limits. I want the mean of the distribution if your null hypothesis were true. What is the name of the standard deviation in this distribution? Just name the name. But realize, even though I'm not asking you to do this, this is a random sampling distribution of mean differences. Not means, not scores, nothing else. It's mean differences on your problem, in your experiment. So every mean difference in one of these represents one experimental result one signal right because remember when i was talking about signal last time experimental minus control winter road minus der wiki that's a signal right we're measuring one signal okay that's the signal so the mean difference is the signal some people try to teach this with two different curves that doesn't make sense that's not how we do the statistics and it's not how the statistics work so do this, create the shape that we're going to use to calculate p-value in the next step for your specific null hypothesis. You will have to create a random sampling distribution for every p-value you calculate for me because if you don't know where your random sampling distributions are coming from, you don't understand statistics, right? We have these bell-shaped pizzas. We're trying to figure out the pizza slices. That's our p-value. You just created the bell shape of the entire pizza. You created the whole. Now we have to figure out how do we find the part that is the pizza slice. Okay, you are going to have to do this for me. You need to understand that the shape is determined by math theory. Most, but not all of our tests assume a symmetrical distribution, like a, like a normal curve or a T distribution. You need to understand that the most commonly shaped mean difference will be the mean difference when the null hypothesis is true. This is not only usually zero, this is always zero. There, I said usually just to cover my ass. There might be a case where it's not zero, but it's so rare... I have not seen it yet. Just also so you know that the, def the most commonly sampled mean difference is a definition of mode. Remember from our discussion of mean, median, and mode that in a symmetrical distribution, mean, median, and mode are all equivalent. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't matter. Sometimes I say mean, sometimes I say median, sometimes I say mode. In a symmetrical distribution, they're all the same number and idea. You need to understand that because this is a um, hypothetical distribution, its limits are negative and positive infinity. It ranges from negative to positive infinity. It's a probability ruler. This shape is our probability ruler from negative infinity to positive infinity on mean differences. It's a distribution of mean differences, not a distribution of means, not a distribution of scores. It's a distribution of mean differences. So to complete the analogy with my pizza fractions problem, you need to realize that the area under the curve between the number line is equivalent to the entire circle in the pie chart. Let me show you. 
right? This whole circle has a proportion probability of one, right? A probability of one, one out of one. This entire bell has a probability of one. We have just created our entire circle. And so just like in the previous example, we had to figure, eight, figure out how to define the blue pie area. For our p-values, we have to figure out how to define these gray shaded areas. Let's move on to that. This is the second part. We drew the shape. Now we gotta draw the shaded areas. Let's draw the p-value problems shaded areas. All right. So, so let's say I sampled a mean difference of 10 in my experiment. Women were 10 points more empathetic than men, right? So now I have my shape. I added my sampled mean difference because it's a sampled mean difference to my, to my previous bell curve shape. And I've shaded in this gray side. I've actually unshaded the other side. They were grayed in before, but we weren't calculating them. Don't worry about it, right? I need to find this area. Why? It's because the definition of a p-value, the probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme equal to 10 or more extreme anything greater than 10 if the null hypothesis were true, which is the entire shape. That's where the p-value comes from, right? The probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference I sampled if the null hypothesis were true. This is our pizza problem. This is the slice of pizza that Donatello ate out of the hole. I'm trying to figure out this proportion, this probability, this percentage. Probability is this divided, is this size of this area divided by one, okay? The area of the whole bell adds to one, so this area adds to less than one. The bell adds to one, this is less than one. I need to find the probability of sampling a mean difference, has extreme or more extreme, ha has the mean difference I sampled if the null were true. This whole picture is if the null were true. In this case, the, the, my blue area on the circle is my gray area in this picture. It's equivalent. They are basically the same problem in terms of the way you think about it. Now, there is a second. So remember, p-value is a probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference I sampled if the null were true. I sampled a mean difference of 10, right? We can clearly see that sampling a mean difference of 10, right, is as extreme as 10. More extreme than 10 would be a mean difference of a billion. We can see that over here on the right side. What's going on over here on the left side, right? Well, all people are saying is that negative 10 is as devious from the, the predicted value, if the null hypothesis were true, right, it's as devious as 10. So it's just as devious as 10. It's just as devious. 10 and negative 10 are just as extreme, right? Those are equally extreme, extremely sampled mean differences. So when we're asked to find the probability of sampling a mean difference, has extreme or more extreme as the mean difference we sampled, it doesn't just mean has extreme or more extreme than 10. It means has extreme, has negative, or more negative than negative 10. It means both sides. I mean, essentially, if you calculated this, this p-value for this side, this area, you can multiply it by 2. We have statistical programs that do these calculations for us. But essentially, at the end of the day, right, you can interpret the p-value definition in two different ways. You can interpret it as the probability of sampling a mean has extreme or more extreme than 10, only on the positive side, or accounting for the mirror image on the negative side, negative 10 in this case. All right, so in terms of p-value, you, your p-value is the sum of this area and the sum of this area. The, you have to draw this type of p-value setup before you calculate your p-value just so I know you know what you're doing. I also need you to make sure you understand this is a distribution, not of means, not of scores. It's a distribution of mean differences. And why are mean differences important? Because mean differences represent your signal. This is a distribution of signal. What's the probability of finding a signal has extreme or more extreme than the signal I found if the null hypothesis were true? Well, it's we have our bell shape that adds to one. We have to get these two areas of these pizza slices. It's the same problem as the Donatello problem. So 
these two ways to define has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference we sampled are called one-tailed and two-tailed tests. You can see why very clearly on this picture. Now I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I'll never ask you to calculate a one-tailed p-value because guess what? We don't calculate one-tailed p-values for studies in research methods. It's rare when you use a one-tailed p-value. Um, basically, yeah, basically it's not really acceptable. I've done it once, but it really just, I don't think it should have went through. Um, it was published, but you know, it was kind of, it's kind of not really acceptable. Um, but essentially the acceptable, okay, so here's when it's acceptable. When you're making a directional prediction, if I'm predicting in this case that women would be more empathetic than men, I, you know, and I predicted that before I looked at the data and you can trust me and I pre-registered pre my experiment with this pre-registration sort of community, then I should be able to use a one-tailed t-test. But still, here's what I'm going to tell you. You can't use a one-tailed p-test on your research methods posters. Um, I think they'd mark off for you on your papers. For, for me, I know you can use it if you're making a directional prediction, but even in those cases, you couldn't publish it because no one would believe you. So with that being said, when do we use a one-tailed versus a two-tailed? For you, always use a two-tailed, but you do know that we use a one-tailed when we're making a directional prediction, when we're making the prediction that women are more empathetic than men, right? That's the argument. You all are making a directional prediction, but you're not allowed to actually use a one-tailed p-value in this class or to publish things. So we use two-tailed p-values. It's convention. Get used to it, right? So most of our problems are going to be, most of our problem setups are going to look like this. If I don't say the tailedness of the study or of the test, it means you use two-tailed. So we're on to homework problem number three. Use the same example as before. Step number one is you're going to make believe a massive mean difference for your example. Choose that massive mean difference. Think about the numbers in your experiment. Think about the scales, the ranges of them, maybe their percentages, maybe their correct, maybe their number of correct, maybe their sweating, maybe their brain waves. Just think about what they are and think about what a massive difference would be. What's, what's the largest difference you could possibly observe? on your scale. Just think about that. And then step number two, create a one-tailed random sampling distribution of mean differences. And step number three, create a two-tailed random sampling distribution of mean differences for your example. Now, we're going back to my example. What if I only sampled a mean difference of two? Now, I sampled a mean difference of two. That's not, that's a smaller difference. What happens to p-value when I sample a smaller mean difference? Does it increase or decrease? Well, let's, let's look here. This is our p-value when we sample a large mean difference. Let's say it's x. Let's say those gray areas, this plus this equals x. I sampled a mean difference of two. I've told you two tail is the convention. This plus this equals y. What, what is larger, y or x? One, two, three, four, five. State your answer. Y is larger, right? So, oh, let's go back and look at that. We have a smaller effect. Our p-values are larger. You have to realize this, right? Large p-values are not great. They're not great for those of us that are looking for significance, and which is every single person in this room. Large p-values are not good. Small p-values are better. The larger your effect, 10, the smaller your p-values. That gray area is smaller than that black area. That gray area represents a larger mean difference. The probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme, has the mean difference we sampled, if the null hypothesis were true, is that p-value is smaller when the sampled mean difference is larger. That p-value is larger when the sampled mean difference is smaller. Learn that. So problem number four, still use your same example. So it's basically step number one, except make believe that you sample the tiny difference for your example. Don't choose zero, A any tiny difference but zero. Choose that mean difference cannot be zero. Do the same thing. Create a one-tailed random sampling distribution of mean differences. Create a two-tailed random sampling distribution of mean differences. And when the mean difference is larger, does your p-value get smaller or larger? Right, so when the mean difference is larger, is your p-value smaller or larger? Give me your answer. 
What if I only sampled a mean difference of zero, right? In a one-tailed test, my p-value would be 0.05. What's the probability of sampling a mean difference as extreme equal to zero or more extreme than zero? That's 50% of my distribution. In a two-tailed test, my p-value is one or 100%, right? So my pro technically you should state p-values in probability, but I understand if you're like me and percentage makes sense and probability doesn't make sense, right? But percentage divided by 100 is probability. Okay, but when you sample no mean difference, all right, your sampled mean difference was zero. The probability, the probability of sampling a mean difference is zero, has extreme or more extreme, has a mean difference of zero, if the null hypothesis were true, is 100% or a probability of one. So, when you have no effect, your p-value is one or 100%. This is just illustrating my same point. Large p-values are not what you want in your study if you made a prediction like I made in this example. I wanted to see a, I wanted to see a difference where women had more empathy than men. Right? That's what I predicted. That's what I expected to see. And when I mean wanted to, it's not like I'm dying to do it. I'm a scientist. I can remain objective, but let's be real here. I, I had that hypothesis. I thought it was correct, right? So the, the, more, the smaller my sampled mean difference, the, less, the smaller my signal, the less likely my hypothesis is correct, my alternative hypothesis is correct. My hypothesis that women would be more empathetic than men, that's the alternative hypothesis. It's not the null hypothesis, right? The larger my p-value, the smaller the effect, the larger my p-value. When there's no effect, my p-value is 100% or one. It's beautiful. This one's easy. Number five, you sampled the mean difference of zero. Your p-value equals one y. Do not overthink this problem, but use the definition. The probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than zero. And remember, I didn't tell you what tailedness, so it's always two-tailed. So unless I say it's one-tailed, it's two-tailed. I didn't say, so now you just got to tell me. And the answer is pretty simple. It's because all numbers are has extreme or more extreme than insert blank. If your mean difference is large, will your p-value be large or small? I don't want you to tell me this because the answer, I'll give you the answer right now. It's your p-value. If your mean difference is large, your p-value will be small. Show it to me in a picture and note, I have a picture in the previous slides that is this answer. I just want you to write it down for practice. Yes, this is an easy question. I'm not trying to be hard. I don't want to have to correct a lot of stuff you know, like last time, but still, right? Like I want you to get this idea. Okay, now we're on to our final slides where we're talking about, okay, we calculate, we calculate p-value. We're not doing that today. Computer programs do that for most days. So I'm just gonna skip the step of calculation and show you that next time. But how do we interpret a p-value? P-value is the probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference I sampled if the null were true. So let's say my p-value is 0.25. There's a 0.25 probability, 25% chance, that I would sample a mean difference has extreme or more extreme as the mean difference I sampled if God knew the null hypothesis were true. I threw the if God knew in there just to illustrate that this is a theoretical distribution. This is all based on perfect like knowledge. So the only person that could know this would be God. And I, I'd like to throw that in there just to show you this is not a real distribution, it's a theoretical distribution. Now if your P now in psychology, if your P value is greater than 0.05 or a 5% chance, you do not have enough evidence to reasonably disprove your null hypothesis. We technically say you retain your null hypothesis. You also do not have enough evidence to assume the two population means are the same. So just because you, you found that 
you did not have enough evidence to disprove the null hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that there is no difference. You can't assume that there's no difference between these two means. You do not know that. You do not have, you also do not have evidence to assume the two, popula two population means are the same. I would really like you to verbally say, at this time, I have not disproven the null hypothesis that be specific about your null hypothesis that men, that women are more empathetic than men. At this time, I have not disproven the null, hypo null hypothesis that women and men are equally empathetic. Yes, I said that wrong a second ago. I said the alternative hypothesis. At this time, I have not disproven the null hypothesis that men and women have the same level of empathy. I also have not disproven my alternative hypothesis that men and women have different levels of empathy. Now this, this 0.05 or 5% cutoff is called alpha. Technically, alpha can be whatever you set it to, but in psychology, you have no choice but to set it to 0.05 or more extreme. You can't set it to less than 0.05. Some people are setting them now to like 0.01 and stuff like that. But for you, in research methods and where every psychologist starts off, they start off setting their alpha of every single p-value problem to 0.05. It's always 0.05. Um, so the symbol for alpha is alpha. And when you see that, it means your alpha is 0.05. I mean, there's a couple different types of alpha, but, you know, this is the alpha level is our cutoff criteria. In this case, 5% or a probability of 0.05. Is the probability, if the probability, if you find that the probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference you sampled is less than 0.05, less than or equal to 0.05, then you make a different conclusion. But right now, right now, our p-value is greater than 0.05. Let's go to one where the p-value is less than 0.05. The p-value is the probability of sampling a mean, well, so the alpha is just your level of your p-value that sets the barrier of significance. Anything less than your alpha is considered a significant effect. So we'll go here, right, building on that. Our p-value is the probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than the p-value we, I, you, it, them sampled if the null were true. Our p-value equals 0 0.001. There is a 0 0.001 probability, a 0.1% chance, that I would sample a mean difference, has extreme or more extreme, has the mean difference I sampled if God knew the null hypothesis were true. Right? So think about it this way. The null hypothesis, this, the null hypothesis is set up such that the signal is zero. Right? that there is no difference between your two groups. Now, that is our entire distribution. If I find that the probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme as the mean difference I, I sampled, has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference I sampled, is a 0.1% chance or a 0.001 probability that is so small. It is so unlikely that I would sample a mean difference as extreme as the mean difference I sampled if the null hypothesis were true. It's so extreme that I conclude that I have enough evidence to disprove this null hypothesis. If my p-value is less than my alpha, my 5% chance, your alpha is always 5% chance in this class. You have enough evidence to reasonably disprove the null hypothesis, the hypothesis that men and women are equal in empathy, the hypothesis that smells and no smells have no effect on memory, right? I have this, like that smells and smells aren't different on memory, right? The, the hypothesis that there's that your signal is zero, because remember from the previous lecture, mean one minus mean two is our estimate of signal from our central tendency unit, right? So there's a 5% chance, well, in this case, there's a 0.1% chance that we would sample a mean difference, has extreme or more extreme, has the mean difference we sampled if God knew the null hypothesis were true. 
because our p-value is less than our alpha of 0.05, we have enough evidence to reasonably disprove the null hypothesis. Remember, science. this is where the stats meet the philosophy of science. Good science is falsifiable. Good science is not proof. Good science is disproof. This is statistical disproof. We are disproving the null hypothesis. So, we reject we, what we say is we reject the null hypothesis. We, at this moment, retain the alternative hypothesis. So for my example, the alternative hypothesis, as long as the descriptive statistics match up, would be that women are more empathetic than men. However, just so you know, the literature doesn't support that idea. Gender differences don't really exist in many domains. Look up Janet Hyde's The Gender Similarities Hypothesis. So basically we're saying we've disproven our null hypothesis. I conclude that the two population means I'm interested in are mathematically significantly different from each other. I, I conclude that the population mean difference that I am interested in is not zero. That's all I can say. I'll add that to the slide when I'm done because I just thought of that. But I'm at the... Yeah, I'm basically at the end of the PowerPoint, and I want to talk about one, your final problem. Draw your p-value p problem picture for the following information and interpret the p-value like I did on the previous slides. So your, my IV equals creating confusion, Kafka versus reading a normal story, my sampled mean difference equals 4, my sampled p-value equals 0 .045, my, I have a two-tailed test, right? I want you to show me the what p is in each of the tails, so you're going to have to take that 0 0.045 and divide it by 2 and show me arrows to shaded area areas, and your alpha is 0.05 because your alpha is always 0.05. So I want you to interpret that. But I'm, and that's the end of your problem for this homework. These shouldn't be too bad. I'm trying, you know, I think, I think you're getting the main points here. The main points that you need to leave here understanding, understanding is that one, Calculating p-value is no different than those pizza problems. The shape is a bell. You need to know where that comes from. You need to know that that's a random sampling distribution of mean differences. When the null hypothesis is true, right, you need to be able to set that up. You need to be able to shade the areas to show me what you need to find when you have a sampled mean difference like four, right? I want to see that. I want, you know, I want you to... Show me that on the picture. I want you to show me how where where the p value comes from. Like that 0 0.045 is split between the top tail and the bottom tail. I want you to understand what it means when your probability of sampling a mean difference has extreme or more extreme than the mean difference you sampled is less than 0 0.05. What does that mean? Right? Right? When we're assuming the null hypothesis is true. Well, in general, it means we don't assume the null hypothesis is true if our p is less than 0.05. We actually assume we've disproven the null hypothesis. When we don't disprove the null hypothesis, there's nothing we can really say other than we have not currently disproven the null hypothesis, but we haven't proven it correct either. I want to tell you a final story about science. And this story is why Freud is responsible for the p-value. Freud had psychological scientific theories that were viewed as respectable scientific theories when Freud made them because scientific theories when Freud made them were all about trying to prove every observation and literally doctors like Freud would just make observations from notes and derive conclusions from them. Well, there's a difference when you're doing this with things like cancer and when you're doing this with things like the mind. Cancer, you can actually see, even if you're dead and I open up your mind, I can't see what made you anxious, right? Unless I know a little bit more about that. I'm not just going to be able to see it, right? And so Freud made up a bunch of crap. Um, Freud said, if I'm talkative, Brian is personally talkative because he never learned, he didn't learn potty control when he was a kid. That's literally what he would argue. I am messy because I didn't learn how to control my poop when I was a child. That is a ridiculous idea. Freud also said that um, the reason why, the reason why an individual learns their role, their gender roles, is because they want to have sex with their opposite sex parent 
And in order to do that, they learn to be like their dad, the person that their parent is currently having sex with. That, those are messed up ideas. They're not scientific. You had actual scientists in psychology at that time doing more on the cognitive side, right? Cognitive behavior side, doing all this cool measurement stuff, creating these, these awesome ways to measure perception and to measure reward and all this stuff that were just like, ugh. Man, I'm doing this stuff way different than this guy. This guy is completely unscientific, but I don't have a method to show why they're wrong and why I'm not. So everybody's pissed off at Freud. You got to understand this. One person in particular that was pissed off at Freud and other scientific theories, but mainly Freud and Marx, was a guy named Karl Popper. Karl Popper said that science is about disproving things. Science is falsifiability, right? And then Popper proved in his work, which is kind of ironic, that Freud's theories were not falsifiable. <laughs> and because they weren't falsifiable, they weren't good science. Good science is falsifiable. Where does this come from? Simple thought question. Tell me what you would have to do to prove that all sheep are white. You would have to collect all sheep. You would have to collect all sheep ever. You would have to continue to collect all sheep ever from now to the from the beginning of sheep's existence to the end of their extinction. To prove that they all were white, you would have to have a perfect count of all sheep ever made. This is impossible considering that nobody kept count before these questions were asked and sheep existed before we did. So we'd never be able to prove that all sheep are white. But all I have to do is find one black sheep, disprove the idea that all sheep are white, and this is why falsifiability is science. And Freud pissed off Popper, and Popper developed a whole idea of philosophy of science that said we have to disprove things, not prove them. All right, so how do we do that in science? Where does this come from? Well, the Popper stuff was from about the 30s, I believe. But a, a few, like 20 years before, two folks, Student and Fisher, developed these p-values that we're calculating now and these ideas. And you see these ideas aren't that complicated. So like if you would have traveled back in time, you could have developed frequentist statistics. I've just shown you where they came from, right? But they, they had these methods, okay? But nobody in psychology was used. They had these methods uh, at least 1880, I think. So these methods existed for like 50 years and we weren't using them in psychology. You had, you had like the behaviorists, you had um, the structuralists, the functionalists, you had them like trying to do real experiments. They were pissed that Freud was considered a psychologist, but we didn't know how to verbalize he's not scientific other than I don't like him, his theories are weird and silly, and I, I don't know where they're coming from, right? But he says they're coming from data, so ah. Uh. Then you had Popper who came along and said, this is not falsifiable. So everybody's like, okay, it's not falsifiable, it's not science. But then people were like, well, shit, how can we be more objective in our falsifiability claims? This is when Fisher wrote a book. It was called like Practical Statistics for Statistical Managers or something like that. That book made these statistics that we are talking about in this class easily interpretable by psychologists, psychologists who hated Freud and Jung and psychologists that wanted to be able to live by the idea of falsification because they, they acknowledge that Freud was not science because it was not falsifiable. But we didn't have a method, a statistical method of falsifiability. Now, our entire p-value statistics calculations are about falsifying the null hypothesis. Now, the null hypothesis is that mu1 equals mu2, mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. And when you see that zero, it's not a rounded zero. It's 0 0.000002 to infinity, right? So the one thing I do want to say, the weak point in p-value statistics, the point that makes them not my favorite, the weak point there is that the null hypothesis is basically a straw man. The null hypothesis is always wrong. Two population means being identical like, let's just take my empathy example. Let's say the mean of the men was was 10, 10.000001, and the mean of the women was 10.000002, right? Technically, in that case, mathematically and statistically, the null hypothesis is not true. So for most 
most things we study, the true the true no hypothesis, the true two population means are not perfectly identical. So I want you to keep that in mind. We are falsifying a straw man to some degree. I'm not going to tell you what to do differently because we don't have time this semester. But I want you to understand the foundation of these p-value based statistics, right? This is the foundation. All it is is one of those pizza fraction problems from elementary school, except the pizza is shaped like a bell. And your sample mean determines the size of the slice. It is not that difficult. Thank you. Great work.